This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Hi, this is Greg LeBlanc. Welcome to Unsiloed. And I'm here with Paul Ehrlich, who is uh, not only professor of biology at Stanford, also the president of the Center for Conservation Biology at Stanford. He's also affiliated with the Millennium Alliance for hum- Humanity and the Biosphere. And of course, the author of a lot of books, uh, including uh, the most recent book, which is uh, co-authored. It's called uh, Jaws. Um, and we'll talk about that. Also, plenty of other books. We've got you know, The Dominant Animal, which is uh, really a masterpiece. Um, Human uh, Natures, which is also a fantastic book. Um, Population Explosion, I think, is probably his most famous uh, early uh, work. Uh, World of Wounds, Wild Solutions, Annihilation of Nature. Lots and lots of books. Nice Welcome, Paul. So we have a lot that we can possibly discuss. Um, uh, and I want to start off by just uh, talking about this latest book, because for those people who are familiar with you and familiar with your work, uh, they might look at this and they might think, well, this, this seems to be a departure. Uh, you're talking about uh, medicine. You're talking about uh, issues of, of relevance to child rearing, to uh, maybe mismatches between human uh, uh, child rearing practices and, and uh, eating practices and uh, historic practices. But in fact, this is something that's really right up your alley, uh, something that, that, you know, maybe you could have been writing books like well, this I, all I along. I got right? into it through conservation of jaguars. Uh, one of my closest uh, colleagues, Gerardo Ceballos in Mexico, uh, and I have been working together on the destruction of biodiversity for a couple of decades. And he got together with a, uh, he's from UNAM in Mexico, the major university, and he got together with some Mexican friends, actually a Mexican and American friend, a couple, uh, to establish an NGO uh, from uh, uh, looking at everything from the rainforest to the reef and particularly jaguars uh, in Mexico. And it turned out uh, that they became very friendly. And then the couple lives only a few miles from both of us uh, in San Mateo. And we became friendly and um, discovered that we all liked uh, something that you've probably never heard of. You know, if you crush grapes and let them ferment for a while, uh, they make a rather nice drink. And so we ended up doing a lot of wine drinking I'm, together. I'm familiar with that. And it turns out that the the wife of the conservation couple was a um, an orthodontist. And she started talking to me about the things she thought were wrong with the orthodontic profession, things that she found when she tried them on her own children didn't work and so on. And this led to great embarrassment to me because... My basic training was in evolution, and it had never dawned on me why, you know, virtually all the kids in wealthy countries have braces in their mouths. What's wrong with their mouths? How come if there's some problem there, uh, is it counter-evolutionarily? Uh, and what did people do before uh, they all had braces? And it turns out, and I got, so I got very interested in this, and Sander was obviously already interested in it, and I started checking things, one of the first things I found out actually uh, with, uh, uh, was a statement from a colleague at Stanford, Richard Klein, who's the world's expert on the uh, paleontology, the history of humanity. And I asked him about this and he said, you know, I've never seen a skull of a hunter-gatherer that had misaligned teeth. This seems very mysterious, but the main answer to why it's happening is very simple, and that is we have brought our Stone Age genes into a McDonald's world. Uh, And uh, this is something that characterizes many of our problems in society uh, because genes change very slowly. People say, ah, well, evolution will do this, that, and the other thing. Yes, it will, but it does it on generation time, and it takes strong selection over maybe 20 generations to produce any really visible change in most organisms. And of course, a generation is 20 years, and there hasn't been 400 years of strong selection for small jaws. In fact, nobody can come up for any reason for having a shrunken jaw and a narrow airway and everybody uh, being subjected to uh, obstructive uh, obstructive airways. You're dealing with an elder person who has... (laughs) 
not only shrunken jaws, but obstructive mm-hmm. sleep apnea, which is one of the most serious things leading mm-hmm. to many uh, human diseases. So um, we got together and wrote the book, and we're slowly converting orthodontists to the view that um, braces are not the basic way to go. The basic way to go is to see that kids are develop properly, and that means learning to chew, to swallow properly, to keep their mouths shut. Uh, mouth breathing is one of the terrible things in our society. If you see someone like me sometimes mouth breathing when they're not running, uh, you know they're pushing towards the wrong kind of future for themselves. And uh, it's proven rather an interesting battle, unlike, uh, not unlike some of fought in other areas in trying to convince people who make a lot of money by putting metal in kids' mouths to temporarily move their teeth around. If you've ever had a kid with uh, braces, you know if you take the retainer out, they just march back to where they were before. It's a temporary cure. Yeah, well, (laughs) and and, uh, we see this sort of thing uh, in in many different areas of uh, great concern. We're beginning, for example, to get um, a lot of people being very nearsighted because so many people are just looking at computer screens like I sometimes do, curiously enough, uh, and don't look out. And it looks like it's not clear whether the uh, buildup in myopia and nearsightedness is due to not looking at distant views enough uh, or to Mm -hmm. different light regimes because your eyes evolve to operate in light and then in dark uh, and not operate much in dark. We're not sure what the cause is, but we certainly know that something, the you know, hunter-gatherers did not have to wear glasses. Uh, so uh, the, the whole issue of bringing our genes, what we evolved to, um, uh, to do, into a totally different environment, uh, is, it's a basic story of why we're in trouble. Uh, when we... <laughs> do you want me to keep raving or do you want me to give you Well, I mean, a couple, couple points here. I mean, one is that, um, you know, evolution is not a hypothesis anymore, as you mentioned in your book. I mean, it's a theory. It's everyone has understands yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and yet um, it seems like when you talk to people like medical professionals, they, they have a very weak grasp of, of, of what genetics is all about. So, for instance, if you talk to an orthodontist, they'll tell you that the reason for your crooked teeth is is genetics. And they'll say that. And if you genes. know, if you talk to an yeah. eye doctor about the reason for your myopia, they'll say, "Well, it's you know, it's genetic." And and this seems to, I mean, causally, tautologically, that's true. Uh, you know, it's a but for cause, but but it seems to to represent a kind of a failure to understand really what what genetics is is saying. Yeah, I I think that. All right, I'll rave a little bit on that then. Uh, uh, f- first of all, you often hear it said that. Uh, if your kid has uh, has crooked teeth, that's genetic. Or uh, if you, you have short-sightedness, that's genetic. And actually, the phrase not that's genetic is totally meaningless in biology. There is no such thing as just genetic. Every characteristic you have has been worked on both by the DNA that's encoded in your cells, uh, sometimes changed, uh, and by the environment. And even the things that seem most controlled uh, by the genes have big environmental uh, components to them. And the thing to keep remembering when we talk about evolution is the time scale. Uh, I have made fruit flies resistant to DDT in eight or nine generations. That's in a little more uh, by killing off 95% of each population each time with DDT. And people have often said to me, well, you know, if fruit flies can become resistant to DDT, why do we worry about it? We'll become resistant to DDT too. And I say, yeah, if you kill off 95% of human beings for 400 years uh, uh, with, uh, with DDT, after 400 years, we'll be pretty used to DDT. But I don't think that's the way to deal with the problem. So uh, it's a lot. It's great to throw genetics around, and it's very popular because uh, the biologists have discovered in great detail, in, in stunning detail, uh, how a lot of the genetic machinery works. Uh, we're in the middle of a period where a lot of idiots are anti-science. 
but everybody's dying to get a shot of vaccine. That is the result of decades of highly detailed molecular biology on an extremely complex system where I've been stunned with how much my colleagues have learned. I've also been stunned how much they say we don't yet know about things like what makes a memory T cell last X years in one person and X days in another and so on. But um, evolution is the basis of all of biology. And if you don't have basic understanding of evolution, you don't have a basic understanding of how the world works. And it leads you, and it led me to not question why all kids need uh, braces. Uh, it's really hard to remember. Uh, well, I think some if, of these if, you know, one of the distinguishing topics in your work, in all of your work, is this concept of, of kind of coevolution, and um, and humans are engaging in this kind of gigantic selective breeding project where pretty much every species on the planet is really being selectively bred by by human activity um and and you know some that's, of it's intentional and not being very well adapted yeah i mean yeah. and so i think you know humans have been yeah. profoundly successful uh, i think the vast majority of the biomass on the planet is humans or or livestock of humans right that's something like 95 percent of all mammals are basically people and cows throwing a few sheep and so on but uh the 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 basic point is that you've got to have an overall evolutionary and ecological viewpoint to understand what's going on for example uh there was a moron who was president of the united states who said that it was a great surprise uh to have a pandemic well of course the scientific community has been warning about pandemics for a long time, pointing out, A, that all of our infectious diseases are transfers from the diseases of other animals, and B, that we've made ourselves the pot of gold. I mean, after all, when, 65, when 95% of the, uh, of the weight of mammals, and uh, a big portion of that is the weight of people themselves, not just the cows, uh, you're a bonanza for a virus that can manage to evolve and invade you instead of living in a bat or living in a, uh, uh, a number of other animals uh, because we are, are the great feedstock. We're a, a, a gigantic food base uh, for a coronavirus, as we have recently seen. And we should be taking precautions all the time and be prepared all the time the same moron during his uh, tenure as president shut down the office that had been produced, been put in place by the previous administration to warn us about pandemics. There wasn't any great mystery in what happened. It was totally expected. And fortunately, the scientific community, even when it wasn't understood how important it was, continued to make the basic discoveries that allowed us to, m to come up very rapidly with now, I think it's six functioning vaccines, and they don't all function the same way. They function to a biologist in quite different and interesting ways, uh, but it's a great demonstration of science in a uh, community and a nation uh, where people still say, oh, well, uh, we can't trust the, the science on climate, or we can't trust the science on poisons, and so on, always produced by the uh, uh, the people who are paid to say those things. So I think in the, in the grand scheme of intellectual history, right, there are folks that, that believe that, you know, humans should be conquering nature and channeling it towards their own ends. And there are others that are more uh, skeptical of that project. I think uh, it would make, you, although you are a profound fan of science, you, you I think we could say ser safely that you're in the second camp, that the um, humans tinker with nature uh, at their own risk. Um, could you talk a little bit about, I mean, in the book, you talk about soil, you talk about water, and you talk about biodiversity. And I think biodiversity is the thing you've been working on the most. What is the, uh, what is the biggest concern about the reduction in biodiversity on the planet? Well, first of all, we are part of biodiversity. And one of the things that is not taught enough in our educational system is that we are part of nature. We are not separate from nature. And we depend utterly on nature for uh, 
our lives. We could not exist without biodiversity. For example, the relatively stable climate we have uh, is very highly dependent on diversity, in particular in things like how many trees we have around and where they are. They control, they help control the entire climate system. Uh, much of the water that we drink is assembled and purified for us by biodiversity. In the U.S., honeybees alone are said to contribute about $18 billion to the annual uh, economy uh, through their pollinating services. Because if you don't eat the things that are pollinated by insects, uh, your diet goes way down in quality. And the quality of variety of your diet is enormously important uh, to your health. Uh, so everywhere we turn, uh, we're dependent on services we get from natural ecosystems. And ecosystems, a $10 word just for plants, animals, and microbes that live together in some physical environment. You can say you've got a micro, you have a ecosystem in your mouth, uh, or you can say you have an ecosystem for the United States. But what it is doing is trying to draw together the, the many interacting factors that most people are not aware of. Uh, for example, uh, I g can give you a, a direct example, not thinking right, uh, by looking at mutual assured imbecility. That mutually assured imbecility is the United States and Russia having thousands of nuclear weapons uh, so that in case there's a nuclear war, uh, you can blow each other up very thoroughly. Now, if you think having a nuclear war is a good idea, which I don't, but if you should, why waste all the money on thousands of bombs uh, and missiles? Because it turns out John Holder and I did a back-of-the-envelope calculation 30 or 40 years ago. It would take about 12 Hiroshima-sized bombs. That is the size bomb we dropped on Hiroshima, about 15 kilotons, a firecracker by today's standards. Uh, and it would take about a dozen to end the United States as a functioning entity and kill almost every American. And it would interestingly take fewer, maybe nine or 10, to end Russia as a functional nation. And the reason is, if you think about it for a minute, all you have to do is bring down the electric grid and hit the transportation centers like St. Louis and uh, New York and a few other places and uh, everybody starves to death because you can't feed people unless you can transport things. And uh, you can't use, for instance, trucks. If you bring down the electric system, uh, trucks run, at least until very recently, almost entirely on fossil fuels. But you got to pump the fossil fuels. And in order to pump fossil fuels, you have to have electricity. So if you don't have electricity and the main transport centers are shut down, then in places like San Francisco, for example, uh, people mostly would starve to death because they don't they grow food there. You got to move the food to them. And when you think about the way climate disruption uh, really uh, wrecked agriculture, and then you go and realize that it's almost a third, maybe more than a third, of all the greenhouse gases come from the use of the food system from burning fossil fuels in particular, but from running refrigerators and so on, you see that you're, we're in a bind uh, that can't easily be solved. If you, if you shut down all the use of fossil fuels immediately, uh, then you wouldn't get the food either because you don't have enough uh, electrical power to, to run everything. So it's a very complex, interconnected system. And whenever you hear anybody saying the answer is to do this, that, or the other, that ain't the answer. Yeah, we may be able to send a sports car to a moon, but I much prefer them being able to deliver a nice raw steak yeah, to well, me. Like the superpower of humans, as you've pointed out, is is a culture, and we have the ability to be aware of the impact that we're having. Um, are, you, are you any more optimistic today than, than, you, than in any time in the past uh, about people's increasing awareness of the impact that they're having on the world? Um. Yes and no. I was getting more optimistic about through the Reagan and up to the Reagan administration. Since then, on many issues, we've gone backwards. And of course, I have not a single colleague who was not terribly worried about the state of the whole system uh, five years ago and 
during the next five years during the Trump administration became much, much more worried as that administration did everything it possibly could do to kill off our descendants and us if they could do it. The thing, only thing that makes me optimistic now uh, is some of the young people who are really getting upset about what's going on in the world and starting to try and change things. Uh, I wish we had, let's say, another hundred ocasio Cortes. Once again, I can't say her name quite uh, entirely. It's, it's ocasio Cortez Martinez, is it not? Anyway, bright young people who are willing to say what they think is right. I may not always agree with them, but they're all concerned about the state of the world. And when at most politicians, they're concerned about the state of their finances so they can run again and get reelected and in many cases uh, continue to do incredibly stupid things. I have never in my entire life, which is long now, uh, I've not ever seen a legislature in the United States that was so inept and able to act and so on, almost entirely due to one side um, having a gang of thugs. Uh, there's no other way to put it. We had a thug as a president, and uh, fortunately we've had a change, but as you can see by current actions, we still have a lot of thugs. Well, you, you've you been critical of, of ecologists for sometimes not uh, taking a position and advocating uh, interventions and policies and, and uh, just trying to kind of understand the world but not not change it. And I think you, you anal analogize this to uh, doctors who, who refuse to offer up medical advice to their patients. Um, uh, to what extent is, is a scientist re responsible for uh, intervening and, and uh, advocating policy? Or, or is, it, is it sufficient for scientists to provide well, important uh, tools of understanding and then allow others to, to make the, the policy advice? I have a heterodox view on this that is becoming orthodox. And that is when I was trained, uh, I was basically told by my major professor that I had not finished my research until I had taken my results, analyzed them properly, and published them in a peer-reviewed journal so that other scientists would know about it. And a whole bunch of us for the last few decades have been trying to change that to and then explain to the general public what your results mean and what you think they mean. And in fact, some of us semi-formally uh, put together an ethical code for scientists like me who try and talk to the public who are becoming more and more common. Uh, we actually had a training program for mid-range scientists to um, explain to them how to answer a TV interview or so on, you know, the, the ambush interview, the 15 seconds that you get to speak to a camera out of a hearing or something. And the rule was, and for me at least, and many of my colleagues still is, you are, first of all, required to, sh to explain what the consensus scientific view is. Uh, then if you differ with that consensus, you should explain why you differ, how you differ, what the difference is might mean. When you've done that, you're back to being a well-formed common citizen. Common citizens are not restricted from being able to speak. The uh, freedom of speech extends to scientists too, and I think it's then the ethical responsibility of the scientist to say what they think uh, ought to be done about it. You know, if you spend 40 years uh, studying climate disruption, which I haven't, but I've been with people who have, uh, and understand it very thoroughly, uh, why shouldn't you tell the general public what your opinion is of what ought to be done about it, as opposed to a famous senator from Oklahoma who said, humanity can't change the climate, only God can claim change the climate. Well, you got to make your choice. So in, in this, during the coronavirus crisis, there, I think a lot of people were saying, um, you know, you got to follow the science and, and do what science tells you to do. But, but science doesn't really tell you what to do, right? It tells you, you know, what will happen if you do X, Y, Z. It's, it's sort of, you know, uh, it, to figure out what we should do, we need to, we need to yeah, kind of borrow from other, other domains of our human existence, right? You know, if, if, 
If scientists could tell you what to do, wouldn't want them to. I want scientists to explain what they've learned, tell it to people, and give their opinion. Uh, then you got to judge everybody. First of all, most of the big issues in science uh, are totally understandable to a middle school child. So that um, I have full faith in people's a, people's ability to understand things. What worries me is so many of them won't work uh, and fight to get the knowledge. There's a crazy idea in our society that education is something you pour into people between the ages of four and 20, roughly, and then stop. I don't have a single successful colleague who isn't learning all the time and probably spending more time learning, reading the literature, doing experiments, and so on, uh, than anything else. It's a big, complex world, and if you want to have opinions and you want to function in, as, a, as a citizen, you have to do a lot more than vote. You have to spend a lot of time educating yourself and learning to sort out the difference between the people who are lying to you regularly uh, and the, I mean, for example, there are actually people in this country, in the United States, you may not believe this, who think that Hillary Clinton uh, is not just molesting children, but eating them and tearing their faces off and using them as masks and doing this in the basement of a pizza parlor uh, in Washington, D.C. Now, uh, everyone's welcome to their own opinion. But if you can't sort that opinion from what the goods and bads are about Hillary Clinton, uh, then you're in deep trouble. You're just an idiot, and you haven't spent the time learning anything about how you sort problems out, how you look for evidence, how you don't follow blindly some moron with a cue. Well, uh, the, I think the, the, the misperceptions of... of... I know, I know you believe in the Hillary is a cannibal <laughs> I don't, story, but I, I, don't know, I didn't mean I don't, to offend I don't know that we can ever beliefs. do anything about that. Um, we, at best, I think we can try to um, improve the, the uh, insights of, of the highly educated. That might be the, the most ambitious that we can, we can aspire to. Um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned in the book, a very successful policy, uh, is, um, you know, the cap and trade on uh, – for acid rain. So acid rain is sort of a success story, um, you know, where the problem was identified, um, a solution was designed um, in part by, by economists working closely with, um, you know, with scientists. Uh, and, and we've, you know, we've managed to uh, reduce acid rain as a problem substantially. Um, are there other types of, of solutions that we can uh, look to, to try and reduce, for instance, global warming or global heating, as you call it? That, that are within reach, uh, and to what extent do you think well, economists there, can play play an important role in in helping design these policies? I I have a mixed view on this because I've worked with economists more intensively than with any other group over the last thirty years at the Bear Institute for Ecological Economics, for example, and at Stanford. Uh, one of my good friends is. Uh, Kenneth Arrow, who was a Nobel laureate in eco economics, and we published together and so on. And there are all kinds of interesting insights in economics that in a world that is totally financialized, essentially, are ways of getting good things done without any question at all. So on one hand, it's extremely important to have very knowledgeable economists uh, and to listen to what they say and what their plans are, because very often they can come up with win-win um, uh, solutions. Uh, so that's the positive side of economics. Uh, I hate to say some of my best friends are e economists, but it so turns out that my daughter and my son-in-law, my only child, and my son-in-law both have PhDs I'm in sorry economics. to hear that. So uh, some of my best friends actually, <laughs> actually are economists. Uh, on the negative side, um, the whole profession suffers from um, what is known technically as daydream believing. They think on a finite planet where most of the problems come from too much consumption by too many people and so on, that you can just keep going forever and grow forever and that the solution to every problem in some form or another is growth. Now, there are 
outstanding economists who have not only grasped this but written about it. Ken, who's probably the leading economist in the world today, certainly the one most concerned with issues like distribution and justice, uh, who recently recently did a huge study on biodiversity. Uh, for the British government and came up at some point, either in that or just before it, that the it might be possible to support half billion people on the planet sustainably, which I think is possible but far out. But since we have 8 billion today, that tells you something about the course to sustainability. Uh, the other, there are other problems uh, with economics. One is not attention to what they call externalities, which they always make a footnote in their textbooks, but are actually uh, a major part of the entire economic system. Those are the benefits or mostly costs that your economic activity uh, puts on other people uh, without them paying or uh, in, in any for it and uh, or uh, or getting compensated for it. I'll give you a positive example. If you're living in kind of a rundown area and you have your house painted and pay for it, it will increase the value of other people's houses at no expense to them. That's a positive externality. Uh, if you should be crude like I am uh, to drive a car which has at least one exit, uh, fossil fuel burning engine in it, uh, then you're putting a cost on everybody in your community by changing the climate in negative ways and adding poisons to their breathing. And none of us pay uh, for that negative externality. Uh, and as the first prominent steady state economist, Herman Daly, once put it, if the survival of your civilization is external to your model, you probably need a new model. And that's the problem we have. We need yeah, to economists are definitely interested in, in maximizing wealth and income, but they their their metrics of what constitutes income and wealth are definitely subject to question. Um, you know, the natural environment, for instance, has very little value in, in uh, we, we don't know how to account for it. Um and and in part it's because we don't really know what the what the consequences are. Uh, would you would you advise it in situations where we don't know uh, what the consequences are that we uh, are very um, aggressive in our valuations? Uh, should we be? Well, I would advise us to be cautious. You know, if you don't know what's behind a door in a haunted house, uh, you probably don't fling it open and jump through. Uh, but our tendency with everything is to fling it open and jump through. And that can have some very bad uh, consequences. Uh, in other words, uh, the huge technological changes that we've brought about in the last few hundred years, particularly in the last hundred years, uh, have not been done thoughtfully by a community of homo sapiens thinks hard about, let's see how this works. I mean, in this sense, I'm a real conservative. In other words, conservatives generally, if you go back uh, to the origin of the whole business, were people who said, Let's not jump to something new until we're sure it's going to be better than what we're doing now. Uh, and there's nothing conservative about the general macroeconomic policies. There are exceptions to all this. By the way, economics is a vast field with huge numbers of people. They deal with all kinds of important problems. It's mostly at the macroeconomic scale. And in fact, why it isn't is very well known. There's an actually a paper by, I think it was Colander and Clammer, pointing out that 99% or so of economists never have any training in the natural sciences. So they're working uh, in a area where they don't understand what the problem is. Uh, an example, I'll give you an example putting down political scientists. The best journal or the lead journal in political science uh, in, in foreign policy is the journal Foreign Policy. I think they once had a reasonable article on the environment, maybe once. And yet you cannot find a foreign policy issue today that does not have a big environmental component. For example, 
movement of peoples is a major factor in virtually every big uh, international issue. Uh, and that's directly uh, in large part caused by environmental problems, the, uh, the refugee problems. And yet you never see it covered by the uh, most of the political scientists. There are a few brilliant exceptions, but it's uh, we need to totally revise our university education. There has been a problem at Stanford uh, with not enough space for biology. And as I suggested, just close the business school. If you read the books on business schools, you know that even in the terms of business schools, they're lousy. You know, they, they as I, one person quoted, uh, they specialize in learning how to take other people's money and put it in your own pocket. That's the goal of the business school. But it's worse than that because, of course, if they do their jobs right, they generate growth. And growth is a disease. If you, if you have a cancer, you do not want to pick up something that makes it multiply and grow faster. Well, I, I certainly agree that economists have... I know you're an economist. Well, I, I got agree to that economists are... are very deficient in their knowledge of, of the natural sciences. Um, uh, but where I think economists are, are strong is in their ability to uh, uh, think through uh, solutions. So uh, I was interviewing uh, Bob Frank uh, just recently, and, and we were talking about you know carbon tax, and uh, he's a big proponent of carbon tax. And there are more and more economists who are advocating different types of, of policies uh, designed to protect the environment. Um, but economists can kind of flesh out, well, you know, why is it exactly that a carbon tax might be uh, uh, more effective at lower cost than, say, cafe standards or, or other uh, interventions? Um, and how do you design a system that will encourage the, the business people to uh, uh, to work towards towards conservation? I think that's, that's probably what they would say uh, in their defense. I agree completely with that. Uh, my closest economist friend here at Stanford is Larry Goulder, just published a book on economic ways of trying to deal with climate disruption and so on. They do, or to take a current issue, which I cannot explain and maybe you can, but uh, the issue of um, whether you should have a minimum, a guaranteed minimum wage has got all kinds of economic consequences that have been looked at technically. But as far as I can tell, the technical issues don't come up in the public debate, which is, uh, Hey, you know, you, you can do something to help some people that hurts other people and you get into real balance issues. And that's the kind of thing economists are great at. Uh, no, I, I again, I haven't spent my I've learned a lot from economists. I'd like to think vice versa. Certainly my close the people I publish with, we have to agree before we publish the paper. So no, I think uh, you, the econ economics is you said, but you said. I don't believe more than two thirds should be shot. <laughs> you set up a framework uh, in in one of your books that talks about you know if you're trying to look at environmental impact, uh, you know one element is the sheer population uh, of of humanity on the planet, uh, but then there are other factors like um, you know that it's a function of what the impact of any individual human human is, and and in general the the wealthier the society, the, the bigger the impact on a per capita basis. Um, uh, do you think that that's that's necessarily kind of a, a monotonic relationship, or or is there a possibility that beyond a certain uh, wealth level, it's possible for the environmental impact to start to go down? I mean, we're, we're starting to see that, for instance, birth rate goes down after a certain wealth level, um, and uh, uh, and perhaps uh, the ability, the imp impact on the environment could could go down with with greater wealth as people can start to afford different. Well, that's that's the uh, reverse M, M, uh, Kuznets impact, uh, Kuznets curve, uh, that at early on, uh, societies just have to be sloppy. They can't have the environmental controls, and then they can get better controls when they get richer and actually we're seeing bring China. down the impact. Yeah. And the answer is- seeing China cases, start to take it seriously. In some cases, yeah. yes. Like, and in other pollution cases- Pollution in China is horrible. Yeah. Uh, the trouble is we've gone so far- beyond the limits. None of my colleagues, uh, I shouldn't say, I, I will say, but certainly my closest colleagues are worried whether we'll make it another 20 years. And I know I won't, of course, but um, we are so far beyond the limits. Remember, when we started towards the Industrial Revolution, copper was lying around on the surface of the earth at basically 100%. It wasn't ore, it was copper. 
Now we go down more than a mile to get ore that's a half a percent copper. There's a copper mine. I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's out. It's in Utah, and it's something like uh, a mile and a half wide and three quarters of a mile deep that we are getting out and getting the copper uh, out of the ore when it's a small percentage, one or so percent of the ore. That scale of doing things is our biggest problem. The soils around the planet are in trouble. Many places are running out of fresh water. Uh, we're losing the biodiversity that we need to support our lives. We're spreading the, there's a current study, uh, Shanna Swan, who's published more on this than anybody else, uh, shows the solution that's coming to the population problem. Namely, uh, there's a possibility that the human sperm count will drop to zero by the middle of this century. Uh, nobody really knows. We know something about the trends, but it's a very difficult thing to look at. But that's symbolic of the fact that if you could see your blood uh, analyzed down to the tiny little parts, uh, you would find it looks like the shelf list in an organic chemistry lab. Uh, we're loaded with human-produced chemicals, many of which mimic our natural hormones and obviously have potentially serious effects, particularly on young children. And yet you don't hear anything about the toxification of the planet. There are occasional, uh, you know, the uh, uh, endocrinologists have made big statements on this and so on, but nobody pays any attention. It's like with plastics where the the uh, estimate now is by the middle of the century, there'll be more plastic in the oceans than fish. And right now, those plastics are being ground into tiny little particles, so small that when you eat things that contain them and absorb them, they can cross the blood-brain barrier, and they're coated with persisting organic pollutants. So we've opened the door to adding poisons to our brains. And there's some debate about whether or not, uh, particularly after the last four years, whether humanity as a whole is dumbing down. That is, is it really that somebody like Trump cannot grasp what's going on? Uh, not that he's well, just I mean, evil. I think we, we live in a... Uh, by the way, I was just going to say, my views are not necessarily those of Stanford <laughs> that's right. University. That's, that's true for all of us. Um, but, you know, we live in a bit of a bubble uh, in the Bay Area where, you know, we, we can afford to uh, walk a lot and we, we have nature nearby and, and we can eat, uh, you know, local, organic, uh, non, uh, uh, you know, f meats and food that, that has no um, antibiotics or anything else in it. And, 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 you know, the rest of the country makes fun of us uh, for that. Um, but it's also, it does require, it does require a great deal of income. Uh, does it not to, to live the, you know, the whole foods life and not the Costco life? Uh, doesn't that require a certain level of, of wealth? Uh, that it, you see, you're getting down to the really basic things now. I'm having, with about 25 colleagues, trying to work this time, a technical paper on what has to be done. <clears throat> and what there actually is, is a level of places to start, but the level of change that will be needed in our view if we're going to keep civilization going at least in the middle term for another three, four hundred years, something like that, is so colossal people don't want to think about it. In other words, the basic source of our problems was taking up agriculture. Before that, we were a small group. We were relatively equitable. Uh, we were not uh, running down the resources of nature because there were so few of us and we did not have the technological ability. It wasn't until agriculture that we got to the point where one family could produce enough food so that it could support another family, whereas the hunter-gatherers, everybody had to work all the time. And leadership was not elected. It went to the person best at doing something. It might be a hunt leader and a settled disputes leader and a medicine leader and so on. Once you have Settling down, you have the chance for private property. It can lead to fun things like slavery or science and so on. But gradually, we gained in an incredibly rapid time in human history uh, this power to do all kinds of things we really shouldn't be doing. Uh, you remember the agricultural revolution was roughly 10,000 years ago. 
Modern Homo sapiens has been on the planet for something like 300,000 years. When people say, well, when thing is over, we'll get back to normal. We haven't been normal for about uh, eight, 10,000 years. Uh, normal for human beings is what we did for the first 300,000. That's what our genes are adapted to. And now we're a small group animal, desperate. I mean, the average size of hunter-gatherer groups has been calculated to be about 50 to 150 people. And now we're trying to live in groups, in some people's minds, of billions of people. And we're not doing a great job at it, in case that escapes your notice. So uh, the, the answer, in a sense, is to your question, after I wandered on all that, through all that, is that at the beginning, when you have a world that's totally financialized, that your value is judged in some sense by your income or how much and no longer go stacked in your basement, but uh, figures on a bank account on a computer, uh, as long as that is your basic source of value, and it's become that way globally, uh, it wasn't, by the way, it's only a recent few hundred years, basically, that we've switched to a financial standard of value. Uh, and then when you have a financial standard value, things like uh, making people pay for the external negative externalities they're creating is an effective tool. If we look at the issue of how well-off people are, what their well-being and happiness is, the picture changes very dramatically. Uh, since, I can't remember the exact numbers, but there's something economists have done very well, is do a lot of surveys on happiness. And the uh, basic answer seems to be once you've got the the base, you know, shelter your head, a decent uh, diet, and a girlfriend, uh, that uh, getting tripling or quadrupling or ten tupling your income doesn't make that much difference to your happiness. Uh, and in many circumstances, uh, the problems become more intense. I mean, somebody said, "Well, boy." I wish I could have a house like Bill Gates, which is what, uh, 10 miles square or something. And all I think about when I hear that is all the people I'd have to hire and worry about them doing their jobs and then hiring other people to worry about those people and so on. I'd much rather have my own cave. Um, so uh, there's a lot of things that current economics in particular can help us to do to start us in the right direction. But I hope when we start in the right direction, we think really hard about the goals. For example, uh, and what's something that's been discussed much, is uh, is uh, the uh, uh, nation-state system the best way to deal with the planet, uh, with us threatening each other with clear weapons? You're always hearing news stories about uh, when our soldiers are attacked in uh Syria or someplace else, and nobody ever asks the question, why the hell do we have to have soldiers in uh, Syria or in Afghanistan or in Iraq? Uh, you know, we have soldiers all over the world. What does that mean about the, the international system works? Uh, and uh, an issue which comes up a lot in our discussions is, are borders ethical? The uh, the resources of the planet were not divided up evenly among various countries. The shape of the countries in Africa was mostly formed by where Western armies came to a halt against each other. And after they stopped, what they did was designed infrastructure to take the minerals and other things from the interior out to the ports and ship them to England or France or wherever else. Um, so there are huge questions about how we organize ourselves, which aren't thought of. Uh, but there are the immediate questions of how the hell do you solve the problem of, take an example, in the United States today, the huge number of people who are out of work, often hungry, and so on. Uh, and there, uh, the economists, I think, have been quite good, at least most of them, saying we have to have relief, that spending money now at this level is a good thing, even though if you look at the super macro level and worry about the debt pyramid, it may not be as good as it looks, but it's something you have to do now. So we have this sort of terrible conflict between what we should and can do now and what our goals are going to be, unless we're going to see a lot more things like Texas. I mean, last November, I our second home is in Australia, and I choked in the hideous bushfires. 
that swept the tree, killed lots of people, wiped out a lot of biodiversity. Then I came back to the San Francisco Bay Area. Greg, were you mm-hmm, yeah. here for the mm-hmm. wonderful fires? Uh, I mean, those things are all going to be there. They're just the bare start. There are places already on the planet where people can't work outside in the summer. A wonderful paper by, I was by uh, Kirk Smith and some colleagues showing where you just have summer Olympics anymore because you can't do certain things outside. It's not possible uh, to keep your temperature, your body temperature low enough. So we're slowly making large portions of the earth uh, uninhabitable in the summer unless you've got air conditioning. Where does the air conditioning come from? Well, it comes from burning coal, burning oil, uh, and some other sources and so on. Uh, but I, w- I was stunned on a trip to China seeing the huge apartment buildings they were building with low ceiling apartments and air conditioning. And if you opened the window of your car, you choked to death on the coal smoke. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, they're planning to park all those people there. And as it gets hotter and hotter, they're not going to be able to keep them there. I mean, it, it's. I mean, that's 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 the the challenge is we have these two big problems. I mean, we have global poverty and inequality, and uh, and then we have uh, the environmental challenges. And it and it seems that uh, solving the first one is is just going to exacerbate the second one. Right as as these countries get wealthier and wealthier, they'll they'll follow the same trajectory that we've followed. I mean, in India right now, uh, you know, air conditioning is 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 growing rapidly as more and more people are, are using air conditioning, and they're not and they're using old school, uh, you know, fluorocarbons in a lot of the air conditioners they have there. No, we uh, th- when people say, "What can you do besides growth?" I always say redistribution. As long as we're going to set the model for them, to, we're screwed, to use the technical term. In other words, we're going to do exactly, it, it just, uh, as you know, uh, a heavy diet of beef and so on is not a very healthy diet. Uh, I'm not a vegetarian and I'm not against eating meat on ethical grounds, but what's happening around the world, and one of the reasons may be that we had the COVID-19 pandemic is in places like China, as people's economic position improved, and that's the economic p- position as we define it, demand for meat goes up enormously. And one of the things uh, is that all those Chinese love eating endangered species. You, you can, if you take a train in China, you can have a different endangered species for lunch at every station. Uh, and But, uh, of course, those are the things that the carry the viruses that then transfer to human beings and turn out to be a little bit of a different problem. So we've got to somehow, in my view, start curing the, the, by redistribution, the basic ethical problem. Then you can recruit poor people. After all, if you're, for example, if you're an, a, an African and elephants come by and, uh, and a single elephant, if you're a farmer, a single elephant can go into your yard and destroy your year's income and make you hungry. Uh, and when you look at the value of elephant tusks, it's like having a huge value in negotiable bonds hanging off the face of the animal. Well, if I was in that situation and I had a rifle or a spear or anything else, it'd be good by elephant. It turns out that you can turn those things around rather easily, often with just a little subsidy. In one study in Africa, uh, they began to um, license hunters to kill the um, uh, the most damaging elephants, which were often the old bulls, which have the big tusks. And there are all kinds of idiots who will pay fifty or sixty or seventy thousand dollars to take a shot at an elephant, and then they take the money and divide it up among the people of the area, and the people became great elephant conservationists. Yeah, yeah, if your, guard, if your yard got eaten, you get compensated with more money than you could possibly have made from the yard. Uh, and that's the kind of thing we think about to get people's values realigned. Uh, that's going to be a huge problem of realignment. And one of the things that will need to be done is to totally revise our so-called educational system. Uh, and that's that's a minor problem. Probably take 
Greg and me two or three afternoons, but we could get the job done. I'm sure. Well, I, I want to hopefully look for some hope here. Um, and you know, one area where I've, I've seen, I've, I think there's a lot of hope is in uh, solar power. I mean, PVCs had the cost of PVCs have gone down, you know, exponentially for the last uh, decade or so. Um, and, uh, and there are plenty of people investing a ton of money in, in the development of, uh, of solar panels. Uh, and that in combination with presumably some, uh, some carbon taxes could radically change our, our energy sources. Uh, are you, are you encouraged by this? Are you, uh, are you optimistic? I, I got to go macro micro again on you. I'm very encouraged. We've clearly shown that a lot of the energy we need can be mobilized in ways that uh, demand us to use solar energy from the distant past, which is total being depleted and causing real kinds of big problems. There are also problems with solar and wind, but a lot fewer. And it depends on what kind of planning you do. And it depends also, of course, uh, on uh, probably shutting down uh, virtually all uh, limited ability corporations. In other words, if you read Joe Bacon's stuff and so on, if you take the average corporation and you put it on the scale of the standard textbook on mental disease, it comes out as a psychopath in every dimension. That is, you know, the only thing that counts is the bottom line, that greenwashing is common. Joel Bacon, B-A-K-A-N, just wrote another on this topic, but every all of us have seen it everywhere. It's a bad way to organize economic power to free people from the responsibility for the damage they're doing and allow them to do whatever they damn well please. And uh, so that's uh, one of the major things that's being... Uh, the fast-growing, uh, better energy-mobilizing systems from being deployed as as fast and as wide as they should be. Sadly, as those things increase, fossil fuel use has increased as well. Uh, so it's not getting the job done of cutting uh, the emissions back. But that's, again, it's extremely cheery that we can do these things. Uh, it's extremely depressing we're not doing them. To give a to attack ecologists for a change, uh, the whole basis of the mob, the Millennium Alliance for Humanity in the Biosphere, uh, what came at the uh, turn of the century when thousands of scientists got together and wrote a Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which basically said the world's going on the drain, here are the systems that are going first, and so on, uh, stuff that all of us already knew. And Anne and I suggested that what we needed was a millennium assessment of human behavior because the basic situation in the world today is the scientific community knows pretty much what's going on and has very good ideas on what should be done and has no clue as to why nobody's doing it. Uh, and uh, that's the, why you need the social scientists focusing, focusing on important issues. Uh, the, uh, including the economists. Uh, the, it's no mystery that we should be moving away from fossil fuels as rapidly as we possibly can, mm -hmm. but we're not. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's a, uh, a gigantic problem where I, my hope is entirely in the fact that human beings have adapted very rapidly in the past to all sorts of things, including the Industrial Revolution. Now, if you can speed up destroying the Industrial Revolution's bad side, as much as we speed it up building it to begin with, we might have a chance. Uh, but what I don't see is the trend in that direction. When I hear a current politician say, last year was a disaster. We only shrunk by 1%, and our goal was to shrink by 3%. When you understand that the human enterprise is too large, and that in my view, and I think a lot of other people, the standards of what make you happy are too much focused on renewable junk, uh, and that we will be in the right direction. I have a huge advantage over Greg in that I remember very clearly living in the 1940s and 50s. And, you know, we didn't have cell phones. When I took the job at Stanford in uh, 1959, there were no cell phones. If I wanted to make a copy of a paper, 
I had to put fluids in a thing, take the original, mesh it to the thing, run it through the fluids, hang it on a dryer, and then hide it somewhere because the copy would disappear. There were no Xerox machines. Uh, the I, uh, I had worked on a computer that filled an entire building. Uh, I didn't have a computer in my pocket the size of a credit card with more power. Uh, in other words, we have done uh, incredible things in my lifetime, but I don't remember suffering back in the days when I didn't have any of those things. You know, I still had a decent diet. We even had an automobile. And when I lifted the hood, I knew what everything inside did, and I could fix most of it. Uh, you know, it was a very pleasant life and probably much too rich in a sense. But uh, the idea that what we have today, that having a new cell phone every three months is in it is in my view nuts, but that's a view of an Well, I definitely agree with you that scientists need to, uh, uh, there has to be a better interface between scientists and policymakers, uh, between scientists and practitioners of other occupations like medicine. And so if we circle back to just wrap up with uh, this most recent book, uh, I think one of the things that you said in the very beginning of the book is that, you know, we don't have a health care system. We have a health repair system. And, um, you know, an ounce, ounce of prevention is worth, worth a pound of cure, as we've said. And, and I think uh, in, in environmental policy, um, we, we're doing so, we're investing so much in attempting to repair uh, the, the environment. And uh, there are lots of ways that we could invest more economically just to prevent the, the, repa- the, uh, the damage from being caused. Um, one example used, of course, is the, the, uh, the water reservoir of New York City and, uh, and how, you know, it was much less expensive to restore the, the, uh, the, the catchment area than to, to build a whole new uh, kind of cleaning facility. No, there's, there's lot, you know, we're a very clever species, and I fully believe that we have the capacity to solve the most horrendous problems that humanity has ever faced, the, the existential problems that we've been discussing, uh, we can solve. I actually brought a bunch of social scientists, social psychologists uh, to an Ecological Society of America meeting to talk about marketing to the ecologists because social scientists know a lot about how to get people to go in different directions. And uh, I guess I have to say that my biggest hope is in uh, getting the marketers out there and marketing us towards a secure future. And now I've got another meeting coming up but i assume you actually have three dimensions but it's been nice to meet you on two yes well hopefully we'll meet uh down on campus sometime uh you know when things when things settle down so i appreciate you uh happy to take you to lunch meet faculty club or something like that great speaking with you paul appreciate it yep this is unsiloed brought to you by alumni fm connecting people through stories 